Ordinary physics is physics of the large, of objects and motion and energy and things that feel right, that we can use our sensibility to figure out what's going on. Why does that work? Because we evolved in the presence of ordinary physics. You let something go, it drops. That's normal physics. But when we look to smaller and smaller scales, to molecules, to atoms, to particles, to nuclei, a whole other world of physics manifests to us. It's called quantum physics. The 1920s was the birth of quantum physics. You can't get crazier than quantum physics. Oh my gosh, particles pop in and out of existence. You try to measure it and it's not there anymore, but you saw it there a moment ago. And it was intriguing. Once again, it was the physicist following, you know, the bouncing ball. Weird, crazy things were going on inside the atom. That was basic science. Quantum physics uh, is, is a fascinating understanding of the structure of matter on the smallest scales. Right. Uh, there's, there's particles that pop in and out of existence. I mean, it's a stunning reality that exists at those scales. Now, the whole universe doesn't do that unless the entire universe were the size of an atom. Then when you pop particles in and out of existence, you're actually popping universes in and out of existence. In the near future, entangled particles be used for non-delayed communication over vast distances. Yeah, so what happens in quantum physics mm -hmm. is that particles can know about each other instantaneously at a distance. Mm -hmm. So that if you perturb one particle, the other particle, which is entangled with it, can alter instantaneously faster than like the speed of light. Like twins across, across the world. Exactly. I mean, if, if you want to get sort of macroscopic about yeah. it. Yeah. So entangled particles communicate with one another faster than the speed of light. It's very well understood. One of the rules of quantum physics is that because particles are also waves, if there's a particle on this side of a hill and it can't get across to the other side, the wave function does exist and actually exist in a little bit on the other side of the hill. So the electron can disappear here and reappear there, collapsing the wave function, and the electron would have moved from there to there instantly, basically faster than the speed of light. It's called quantum mechanical tunneling, and it happens all the time. And today is a Cosmic Queries edition on a subject I know we've all been thinking about, maybe not all the time, but sometime, because we've heard it in the news, we've heard people talk about it, it's quantum computing. Uh, so we had, to, we had to dig for some expertise here, and yeah. we, we, we found an old, old friend of Star Talk, Professor Michio Kaku. Tell us what we should know, what com quantum computing will do differently from regular old computing. Well, computers have gone through three stages. Uh, the first stage was analog computers when we computed on sticks, levers, gears. We would turn the crank to do a calculation. That's the computer revolution of today. Now we are beginning to enter the third stage in the evolution of the computer. No longer computing on transistors, computing on atoms. This is the ultimate computer. You can't do better than that, computing on atoms. And that's what the quantum computer is all about. They exist already. They are millions of times more powerful than our most powerful digital computer on certain tasks. At atoms versus molecules. So just some, a little bit of prehistory here, that there was the smallest version of any substance that would then be indivisible of that substance. And so they used the word from the Greek, which meant indivisible, which, and that word happens to be atom and that word has stuck with us. So little did they know, there are the smallest versions of things, although they're the smallest version of elements. The smallest version of an element is an atom. There's no such thing as a wood atom in that sense, right? An, an air atom, right? You have to, some, often you have to sort of break it down further through the molecules and you get to what the molecules are made of, you get to atoms. Then you break the atoms down, then you get to what the atoms are made of. And right now we've got quarks, T together they make the protons and neutrons, and we have electrons, all right, in our experience of the universe. Another asymmetry in physics, okay? Okay. Do you realize an electron, negative charge, negative charge. Right. so now watch. I can draw field lines coming off the electron, and there'll be straight lines coming out. 
They call it the electric field lines, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Hey, uh, Dr. Tyson et al., uh, I remember reading a while back uh, that in a quantum state, electrons were shown to not only have spin, but were kind of able to jump or teleport. Uh, so, Paul, this is not specifically multiverse, but yes. if you're worrying about quantum phenomenon, it's got to show up at some point. Or even when particles what we call tunnel from one state to another state, for a particle to disappear from one place and reappear in another spontaneously via some kind of tunneling phenomenon, mm -hmm. it does that because you stopped looking at it. The yes. act of having looked at it, it sort of keeps it in that quantum state, mm -hmm. if you will. And this is happening all the time for everything. It's just that we can be illuminated by light, but our mass is so high that we don't jump to another quantum state. The laws of physics as we experience them are set in the very earliest stages of the universe. And quantum fluctuations in everything would be responsible for another universe having slightly different laws of physics than ours. Because the quantum fluctuations will take it in a slightly different law of physics direction than our universe. What so, is dark matter? Okay, so I, I'm happy to answer that question. <laughs> we do not know what dark matter is. It prob it's probably misnamed. I know what it is. It's, well, sorry. What it should have been called is dark gravity. There's gravity in the universe. We have no idea what's causing it. If you say dark matter, that implies it's matter, but we don't even know if it is or is not that. But we do know it is gravity with no known source. So it's dark gravity. We can see it's gravity, we don't know anything else about it. We can't see it, we can't taste it, we can't touch it. Our light doesn't interact with it, it doesn't make spectra. We are clueless. Dark energy, a mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space that is pressing against the fabric of the universe, making it accelerate in its expansion against the gravitational wishes of the galaxies it contains. What is gravity? Wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is? So uh, to say, what is it? I think Einstein, in an Einsteinian answer, we would say gravity is the curvature of space and time. That and objects will follow the curvature of space time, and we we interpret that as a force of gravity. That's probably the best answer I can give to a what is gravity question, okay. or why is there gravity? That's the best I can do there. I think that that's a good start. And uh, I can also say that Einstein noted that gra matter tells space how to curve, space tells matter how to move. 